Hello there. Welcome back to the Pacific War Channel, where we cover the entire history of the Asia-Pacific War from 1937 all the way up to 1945, and all the major events led up to it. Today, we are not talking about history. We're going to be playing Axes and Allies, a board game, on the computer, and I'm going to be showing you how to play each faction. Those are Germany, Japan, Italy, the USSR, the United Kingdom, the good old US of A, and uh, if I find time, maybe even little China. So if that's of interest to you, Stay tuned. If you want to just skip on past all the little tutorial bullshit, then go over to this time right now. I hope I did that right. Without saying anything else, let's just jump into it. Axis and Allies is a World War II board game a bit similar to Risk, albeit a bit more complex. Check this out. Take a look at this! Jesus Christ, that right? You can buy the physical game at any board shop, purchase the Steam version, or download the free AAA version. It's free real estate. I highly recommend AAA's version because unlike the others, it's developed by fans, who to this very day are creating custom maps. The maps range from any historical battle you can think of. The Punic Wars, Napoleonic Wars, World War I, World War II, Modern Warfare. Hell, there's even fantasy. Wait a minute. And of course, there's sci-fi maps. I highly recommend the Battle of Arda, Lord of the Rings map, something I play often with my friends. Retarded wizard in the forest. AAA's interface is Java-based, so pretty much any potato PC can handle it. Hey guys, this is Craig from the Pacific War Channel. Please don't forget to check out my YouTube membership or my Patreon account over at wwwpatreoncom channel where you can join the ranks and gain access to a hell of a lot of goodies. At the base minimum, you get access to the exclusive monthly podcast, early access to all of my content, voting rights for what subjects I will tackle next, and at higher tiers, I have much more goodies to come. So please click that link and check it out. So first things first, you need to get the game, which is free and found at AAA-game.org. Just hit that download button. Once it's booted up, there's one more thing to do. Head over to Download Maps. In the high quality section, find yourself World War II, version 3, 1941. The reason why I'm having you download this one is because it's a carbon copy of the most played board game version. It's also arguably the best map ever created and happens to be the main one for tournaments. Now you can play online or local and against people or AI. The AI is actually pretty solid. I like to play it ramped up to the max, but perhaps for you beginners, just start with easy. In all Axis and Allies maps, there are two or more factions. Obviously, since this is a World War II map, it's Axis versus Allies. For this specific map, there are seven nations to choose from. Thus, there are two to seven possible players or AI. Here is the big old beautiful map. And you can see there is Britain, Germany, Italy, the USSR, China, Japan, and the good old US of A. To win a game of Axis and Allies, one typically knocks out the opposing side by taking the capitals. No, 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 wait, 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 One needs their capital to continue purchasing units, so if it can't be taken back by you or your allies, well, it's probably game over. It is optional, but there is another way to win, to claim a certain number of victory cities, depending on the game rules. It's pretty straightforward, but achieving either of these goals can be quite challenging. Like any board game, it's turn-based. For World War II version 3 1941, the turn is Germany, USSR, Japan, Britain, Italy, America, and finally China. Each nation is allocated a certain amount of money per turn. The territories you see on this map have values. After you take one, that value is added to your cash. Each nation can use this cash to purchase units or tokens. When it's your nation's turn to play, the order is token purchase, unit purchase, combat, non-combat, and then finally unit placement. The first thing a nation does each turn is purchase tokens. These tokens act as a dice that is rolled each turn until you get a hit. That number corresponds to a technological advancement. There are countless that increase units' abilities or other goodies. A common strategy is to always have at least one token in play. It's like a wild card, baby. Wild card, bitches! Yeah! After you're done choosing to purchase a token or not, it's time to buy units. 
Each nation has the same units for purchase. In other maps, sometimes there are faction-specific units. All units have three attributes, attack, defense, and movement. For attack and defense, this is a dice value. For example, infantry attack with one or less, so you need to roll a one to attack. But they defend with two or less, so you need to roll a one or a two to defend. Movement number is the amount of territory a unit can move. Typically, it's one. So let's take a look at the units. Starting off, we have anti-aircraft guns that are stationary, and they fire at any aircraft that attack the territory they sit upon. For every single aircraft that's attacking, you roll a one or less. Next, we have the tank. It attacks or defends with three or less, and can move two territories. Tanks also possess the ability to blitz. This means if an enemy controls a territory, but has no units on it, a tank can just take that territory, but move again to take another territory. Artillery has an attack of two, a defense of two, and moves one, and also has the ability to increase infantry beside them for plus one attack. The battleship is the strongest unit in the game. Like all naval units, it must be out in the ocean. It has an attack of four, a defense of four, and a movement of two, and it also happens to have two HP, meaning it has to be hit twice to fall in battle. I didn't hear no bell. Depending on the rules you are playing with, after the battle, the battleship can recover its HP. Battleships and cruisers also have the special ability to bombard land units if amphibiously assaulting. You can roll the dice once to see if you get a hit, and the land units cannot even retaliate. The bomber is an aerial unit that attacks with four, defends with one, and moves six. All air units must land on a friendly territory at the end of their turn, and that territory cannot be conquered that same turn. The bomber also has a special ability to bomb industrial targets, inflicting damage in the form of money lost to that nation. The carrier attacks with one, defends with two, moves two, and has the ability to carry two fighter aircraft. The cruiser attacks with three, defends with three, moves two, and can bombard. The destroyer attacks with two, defends with two, moves two, and has the ability to detect submarines. The factory is where your units are placed. The amount of units one can place depends on the value of the territory the factory is on. You can only have a certain amount of factories in each game. Typically in this game, it's three or less. The fighter attacks with three, defends with four, moves four, and can land on aircraft carriers. The infantry attacks with one, defends with two, and moves one. The submarine attacks with two, defends with one, moves two, and is only detectable by destroyers. This means if a destroyer is not present, a submarine cannot be attacked. They just submerge. You can try, but you'll never catch me. Submarines can only target naval targets and have the special ability called First Strike. They roll first, if they get a hit, they take out the enemy unit, and that unit does not get to retaliate. Lastly, we have transports that don't attack or defend. They transport infantry, artillery, and tanks. Their capacity is one infantry with one artillery and one tank, or just one tank or one artillery. If transports are attacked, even with units on them, they simply die. Their purpose, as you can imagine, is to move troops onto land, and transports almost always require escorting naval forces to defend them. So once you purchase your units, they are left aside until the end of your turn when you place them. In the meantime, the first order of business is combat turn. Here you must strategize what territories to attack in an effort to draw closer to taking the enemy's capital. During combat turn, you can use movement as you please, but it is finite until the end of your turn. Next is non-combat, where you can use whatever movement you have left, but you cannot move onto enemy territory. Lastly, you place your units and this ends your turn. The last aspect of this game is the objectives. These are optional requirements to gain bonuses in the form of more money per turn or to give you a technological advancement. Each nation has its own objectives and they are completely optional, but they can help you win the game. Typically, the objectives are to secure specific territories, sometimes within specific rounds of time. A complete round is when every nation has completed a turn. Typically, if you're playing with friends, a game ends when someone just gives up. Most of the time, if one player, excluding perhaps Little China, is that like a personal attack or something? is knocked out of the game, that team is pretty much done for. Well, we're fucked. If you decide to play with Victory City conditions, well, there's some strategies involved with that, but no one likes playing with that shit. Stop it. Get some help. I recommend playing against the AI to learn the game first. Start with easy, then fast, and then hard AI. The AI is pretty good at this game. The only thing the AI has trouble with is transport strategy. Help me! Help me! Me! 
Germany is arguably the most difficult nation to play. You are encircled by the Allies and you must defend from land, sea and air. Your number one strength is early game rush capability. You're basically the fucking Zerg. You start off with a lot of units, good money, but each round that passes the allies gradually gain more money than you, so your sole strategy is to knock out one ally as quickly as possible. 99% of the time as Germany, you simply bull rush the USSR. Captain, there's a guy we can scare. Yes, it's Rush B, boys. Trying to target the UK, or God forbid the United States, is statistically impossible. By the time you even built up the naval forces to try and amphibiously assault the UK or the US, they can build more than enough defenders to just toss you on your ass. If Germany takes Moscow, in most cases the game is simply over because the UK or the US are very unlikely to retake it or knock out Germany. We are totally fucked. Now in order to take Moscow, you have to break through the Soviet defenders. In a typical game, the USSR will only buy infantry, perhaps tossing in a few artillery or tanks here or there. They call me killer, but I live only to serve the people. The USSR has three factories. Taking Karelia SSR, or Caucasus, dramatically weakens the Soviets and are always fine secondary targets. The way the territories are laid out allows Germany to swing north or south, forcing the Soviets to choose to defend one or the other. Thus, the best way to beat the Soviets is to divide and conquer. The key to success is to threaten Karelia SSR and Caucasus simultaneously, forcing the Soviets to abandon one. Typically, the USSR gives up Karelia SSR first. From there, you threaten Moscow and Caucasus, forcing the Soviets to give up Caucasus. From there, it's simply attrition, but you are clearly making more money than them. As Germany, you have various ways to take out the USSR. The most typical one is a tank bull rush. Tanks move too, so they're the quickest way to go from Berlin to Moscow, and they allow you to open up various routes to it. But you always have the United Kingdom and later the United States to worry about. Basically, you want to neutralize or delay the United Kingdom from landing forces in Europe for as long as possible. On turn one, you literally need to toss the kitchen sink at all British naval forces. If you manage to take most of them out, this typically buys three turns without having to worry about any landings. Ah! My battleship! <laughs> so here is a real example of a game. I am not going to be buying tokens, and instead I'm just going to go ham on tanks. So as you can see here, I am trying to take out most of the UK's naval forces, particularly the transports. I am also trying to do as much damage to Egypt as possible to help my Italian friends, so that they can consolidate Africa. And of course I'm setting up an attack against the Karelia SSR and Caucasus. Crucially, I am trying to keep a large part of my tanks in a position to hit north or south. Your North Sea transports are as good as dead regardless after turn 1, so I like to just get one landing in prior. Combat is done, and as you can see, it's pretty decent results. During non-combat, it's important to position your air power as a deterrent against Britain's navy, keeping your 4 movement fighters or 6 movement bombers able to hit the coastal areas. Now as for your friends, you shouldn't depend on them. I don't need friends, they disappoint me. But most of the time, Italy will do three things. Take Africa, defend Western Europe from landings, and help you hit Caucasus. As for Japan, 99% of the time, they will build one to two factories in Asia and drive slowly through India, China, and Siberia, trying to reach Moscow, rather slowly. If the three of you all just agree to bull rush Moscow, statistically, you're probably gonna win the game. Tanks all the way. So the other players did their turns. Britain knocked out the Kriegsmarine, Italy seized Egypt, pretty much securing Africa, and Japan built a factory on Asia. Britain has a formidable navy, but no transports just yet. How about that little fella? How about that little guy? I wouldn't worry about that little guy. So another free turn of tanks. Perhaps at this point you can buy a single fighter a turn just to build up a defense against Britain, but I am going to go all in on tanks for now. Now looking at the map, Karelia SSR has been left open to take. Grab it and prepare routes to threaten Caucasus in Moscow. I also like to bomb the shit out of Moscow each turn. I'm gonna bomb the shit out of them. It's true. I don't care. Just to bleed the Soviets further. Now it's important to open up a route to Moscow and Caucasus simultaneously, thus forcing the USSR to divide their forces and probably give up Caucasus. Alright, I place most of my stuff near Caucasus to thwart a possible Soviet retaliation and we will see how everyone reacts. 
Japan is consolidating the Pacific and will take China, India, and perhaps even move through Siberia. Italy is consolidating Africa and the Middle East while keeping me reinforced a little bit. Britain has gotten its shit together. Let's give this Nancy a fucking good kick in! Come on, lads! It's going off! Yeah! With an invasion force backed up by the United States. I can't possibly contest them with air power, so now all I can do is continue to strangle Moscow, but also I can purchase a few infantry to defend my capital and counter landings. Alright, Italy is continuing to consolidate Africa, but is defending Western Europe and helping me a little bit push east. Britain recaptured Karelia SSR, but she took quite a few losses doing so, and the US is suffering from a classic AI transport problem in the game. I'm kinda retarded. Basically, the AI calculates the percentage chance of success, and if it thinks you will simply counterattack when it lands and take out all those units, it will continue to build up until it can ensure it creates a proper beachhead. This doesn't mean the AI is just going to sit out the game. It's going to build up and then attack you at some point. Yet again, we are buying almost all tanks with a few infantry. It's actually just an insurance policy. Because I'm about to see if I can GG this right now by crashing upon Moscow. Yes, get lost. Yes, get lost. Though, if I was more conservative, I could wait another round and it would almost certainly mean I would have enough units to take Moscow. But I'm overly aggressive and I feel lucky. No. We'll do it live! F*** it! And with that, that's actually GG. This is because Britain and America can't land and recapture Moscow before I build upon it. In a war of attrition, Germany with the money now it's acquired from the USSR will simply overwhelm Britain and the United Kingdom, especially with the help of Japan and Italy. The vast majority of games end with the fall of the USSR, dooming the Allies or vice versa, like if Germany or Italy were taken out. Now this is just one scenario. If you feel more comfortable defeating naval forces before they land, here is what you can do. As Germany, purchase one submarine and or one fighter a turn. The submarines are cheap and they force the Allies to buy destroyers. However, any money you use to go against the West means you're weakening your thrust against Moscow. It's a tricky balancing game. Goes without saying, I don't recommend building a surface fleet until the USSR is knocked out and then you can unleash Operation Sea Line. It's a team game. You need to adapt to what your teammates are doing, and the best strategy is to always have Italy and Japan coordinate their rushes upon Moscow in general. Don't be that asshole who buys aircraft carriers as Germany in round one. Hey! No! Stop! Just calm down! Don't do it! Well, I really hope you liked this episode on how to play whatever faction I did in this episode of the video because I ended this afterwards. If you really did like it, please leave a like, subscribe, and if you can't, comment on this video. And maybe I'll make some more of these. I really hope you enjoyed it, and I know I did. So, until next time, this has been the Pacific War Channel, over and out. Thank you.